Well, hello everybody, it's Mike from Profiling Evil and I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. I've been all over the country this particular trip. I've been up in Brisbane talking to city officials about the 2032 Olympic Games. I've been down in Canberra meeting with national officials and I'm here in Victoria meeting with law enforcement. I'll soon be in Sydney and meeting with uh, uh, some more federal police officers. And while I was here, I wanted to take a minute and just kind of revisit a case that really struck me. It's the case of Mr. Cruel, and it happened here in Melbourne. That's behind me. I'm, uh, I'm in my room at the Langham Hotel. It's a beautiful place right on the river. I think they call it a river right in here. Anyway, it's probably tidal influence to some degree. I don't know. But uh, this is a community of 5 million plus people. Mr. Cruel got away with murders in the 1980 to 1990 range. I've done a little bit of video on it in the past, so I hope you'll go back and watch some of that. It'll really give you some insight into the case where we really dive deep. And then don't forget to catch my 60 Minutes Australia video with Liz Hayes. We'll track the probable location of his secret lead. When we look at serial predators, we have to look at them much like we would look at an animal. But importantly, we believe you, the public, will be our most critical link. They had two witnesses. A breakthrough sighting. Is this the man? He saw these boys. They saw him. We map the movements of Mr. Cruel. These little pieces, which might seem insignificant at first, become incredibly valuable when all the pieces of the puzzle start to come together. Can you help us crack this case? Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. We did Under Investigation about Mr. Cruel. I think we really changed the outlook on this case. But while I'm here, I wanted to wander around town a little bit, shoot a little bit of video, and, uh, and give you just an update on the case against Mr. Cruel. Again, I'm reaching out to you from the Langham Hotel. This is a beautiful hotel right in the heart of the city. Now, Mr. Cruel is an Australian serial rapist who plagued this country from 1980 to 1990. He attacked at least four girls in the northeast suburbs of Melbourne in the, again, the late 80s, early 90s. Now, detectives believe that he committed a batch of minor offenses for many years before he graduated to abduction, sexual assault, and finally murder. And it only makes sense. In fact, when we go back in time and we look at these kinds of serial predators, they often start out doing some things that seem pretty disgusting, but yet pretty benign when compared to murder. Things like window peeking, where they sit and fantasize. You see, the problem with fantasy is it's always cooler than the realities. And I believe Mr. Cruel experienced those same kinds of emotions as he went out and sexually assaulted and then later murdered these children. Cruel was known for breaking into homes with knives and handguns. Handguns were pretty unfamiliar to the Australian people as far as crimes. In the States, we see a whole bunch more of that. He was wearing a, a face mask. They, they call it a, a balaclava. And they used, he used that to kind of protect his identity from people. This guy was very calculating and cold. He would blindfold his victims. And as a result, they usually were unable to identify him with much detail as far as the accounts were go, uh, concerned. Now, they described him as being between 30 years old and 50 years old. With kind of a slim to medium build, but some described him as having a little bit of a pot belly. So probably a little more mature man. Now to this day, Mr. Cruel has failed to be identified. Yet he's believed to be responsible for probably as many as a dozen attacks. Again, some of those resulting in murders. Now I'm going to put this map and a link to this map out on the description down below. But here you can see all the locations that Mr. Cruel was involved in criminal cases. This, this is the cases that we know about. So let's go back, and I'm going to kind of skip over three early victims, two children 
and one adult that people have identified to be tied to Mr. Cruel. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm not particularly convinced that he was responsible for those. But there were some interesting things. You'll also notice when you look on the map that I've taken from public records the names of a few suspects who were identified over the years and considered to be Mr. Cruel, although never tied to the cases. So, uh, you know, kind of take that with a grain of salt because, again, these were only people that were named as suspects. So the first case was 11-year-old little girl, and this was on August 22nd in 1987. Again, we're talking kind of northeast of downtown Melbourne where I'm sitting right now. Now, this first recorded case occurred on a Saturday. His target was in a little area called Lower Plenty. It's a, a section of Melbourne. And uh, the census at that time provided that the Lower Plenty was white-collar professionals who were in pretty well-to-do families. Now, at approximately 4 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Cruel entered the house by removing a pane of glass from a living room window. Once inside, he pulled out his knife, and, it, and it, this time, this is really interesting because this time he had a gun with him. He located the parents, woke them up, and forced them to comply, allowed him to tie him, and he put them all on their stomachs, getting the kids as well. Now the intruder told the family to remain calm because all he wanted was money. The mother and father, again, had their hands and feet tied. They were shoved into a closet. Now, th this is really interesting because, again, this is where we project our own value system. They went along with them because, you know, they, they would never injure or kill someone. And, and frankly, they just wanted this predator out of their home. So if all he wanted to do was steal some things, they were going to comply. Well, the entire family was gagged and blindfolded with surgical tape. And this is really important because it probably originated with Mr. Cruel, meaning he planned it and brought the tape to the scene with him. Now, the six-year-old son got tied up to his bed, and he was blindfolded also with surgical tape. But the intended victim, the 11-year-old daughter, who, who they've never identified, which is kind of a cool thing they do here in Australia. Sometimes we let way too much information out. And frankly, they're doing that here as well nowadays because of social media and other things. But this 11-year-old child was taken and sexually assaulted for about two hours. During this time, Mr. Cruel kept taking breaks. I mean, imagine the terror of this child and the family who's hearing and trying to imagine what's going on. Cruel even made himself a meal inside the family's kitchen, just somehow kind of sending a message of who was really in charge. Now, the sexual assault was clearly his motive. And the only thing that Mr. Cruel took from the home were some vinyl records, <laughs> those, those old records and an old blue coat. Why? Man, that one's troubling. The investigators in this case failed to find anybody, anyone in the family orbit that they thought would do harm to these children. By appearances, it seemed to be a random attack with no clues left behind. Now, the only thing this 11-year-old remembered was the attacker used the family's telephone to threaten another family, and uh, Mr. Cruel warned this person, who he was faking like he was talking to on the phone, um, he warned them that their children were going to be next. He called the guy on the phone, Bozo. Hey, you Bozo. Now, think about that. The, the extent to which this uh, ruse is going on, because it's very doubtful that he actually called anyone. Now, when police reviewed the family phone records, they found that no call had been made during that time. Again, supporting this idea that it was a ruse. The second child happened on August 27th of 1981 in an area called East Ringwood, Melbourne. Now, this, too, was an 11-year-old victim named Sharon. You can look up and find her last name if you want. And, frankly, you can do a little research even on the map and you'll find it. But it was at 5.45 in the morning on December 27th, 1988, 
when Mr. Cruel broke into the Will's weatherboard home in Ringwood, wearing a ski mask again, and this time wearing dark overalls. Makes you wonder if he wondered and knew a little bit more about DNA and transfers back then. He went to the bedroom of the parents and put a gun to the father's temple, telling the wife to stop her screaming. He then forced the couple to lay down on the bed, and this time he tied them with copper wire, and he took $35 from them in cash. Now, this is really interesting because it appears to me, and makes me kind of think, that he might have had some problems with the other victims, either that first 11-year-old or other victims that we don't know about as far as the binding was concerned. Again, where he was using surgical tape, because this time he's using wire, which just ensures that they're not going to wriggle free of that and get out. Now, another thing that was interesting, and this happened long ago, but doesn't happen anymore because there just aren't many homes with phones that are hardwired in the phone home. He cut the cable to the telephone line outside of the home before going in. So if anyone had attempted to make a phone call, they wouldn't have got that phone call off. Cruel then went into the bedroom where little Sharon was sleeping with her sisters, a five-year-old and two twins that uh, were eight years old. He walked up to Sharon and he called her by name. And wow, is this significant. How he did it, not sure, even to this day. It could have been the fact that the family was in a newspaper article sometime earlier and the children were named. Might have been that there was a document in the home, a school book or something a bit next to the bed table where this child was sleeping that, that caused cruel to know who the name was. But he lifted this little Sharon from her bed, blindfolded her, gagged her by stuffing a little ball into her mouth, and then he taped that shut. He stopped only long enough to pick up a couple of items of Sharon's clothing, and he left with the child under his arm, carrying her like a knapsack. Well, it took uh, the parents about 15 minutes to get free, and they ran to the daughter's bedroom to confront their worst nightmare, a missing child. They ran next door because obviously the phone was cut, and they banged on the door and woke up the neighbor and summoned police. They then endured 18 hours while they waited for Mr. Cruel to dump Sharon near a, a high school about six kilometers from their home. Now, a woman found this child standing on the street corner just after midnight. The traumatized child was only wearing a shirt, and she was wrapped in green garbage bags. Now, the woman rang police immediately, and Sharon and her parents were assembled back together, and police uh, began to investigate her, uh, her claims of what happened. She gave a really detailed report of what happened. And even though she was blindfolded through the 18-hour ordeal and couldn't describe her attacker, she could try, describe some things that happened in result of this case. Things like being driven around for a while by the offender before he took her to a house somewhere where he assaulted her. She said that occasionally he was grumpy, but most often he was soft-spoken and quiet. Now, she also describes to police that he made her stand in a large plastic garbage bag, which he pulled up and taped to her shoulders. He put another bag over her head and taped it to her body before cutting a small hole out for her face. Now, this is, this is bizarre stuff, and it's very indicative of someone who understands transfer of DNA. Again, think about this. This was the 80s and 90s, so this was a new science coming out. He drove this child to his home, lifted her over a fence, and after assaulting her, took her, dumped her uh, by this schoolyard, and told her to walk toward a house where there was a light on and get help. You know, it, it, it was, uh, this was a bizarre case. N number one, because of the extent he went to protect evidence, and two, to dump her off and leave her, th assuming... She, that she must not be able to identify him. Let's talk about victim number three for a minute. 
This was a little girl, two years older, 13 years old, named Nicole. And she was assaulted on July 3rd in 1990 from Canterbury, Melbourne. Now, the thing that's kind of interesting here, folks, is that both uh, Nicole and another victim that we're going to talk about in a moment were both students at the Presbyterian Ladies College, the school for junior high age kids in the U.S. Now, Nicola was uh, abducted from her family's home on uh, the affluent neighborhood called uh, Canterbury. She and her 15-year-old sister, Fiona, were shaken awake by a masked Mr. Cruel. He broke into their home, this time not in the early morning hours, but just a few minutes before midnight, while their parents were at a farewell party for their imminent return to head back to England. Now, this is kind of significant, too, because Mr. Cruel liked to be able to confront the parents to control them. And I wonder if he knew that the parents in this particular case were really at home or surprised that they were gone when he got there, kind of frustrating him as he went through this. Now, the older Fiona, she was like 15 years old at the time, was forced into another room and uh, tied up on her bed. Now, Mr. Cruel was armed with a gun and a knife at this time as well. And he told that little Fiona, this the older sister, who was about 15 at the time, that he would release Nicola if her father, who was a senior partner with an accountant firm, would pay $25,000 ransom. Cruel then walked out of the home with Nicola, and uh, again, he had his arm around her shoulder and held her head very close to him while he maintained control of her and took her from the home. Now, Mr. Cruel took the family's car this time, and he put the child in it, and he started driving around back and forth. About 20 minutes later, they, he dumped the car, and he put her in a different car, I assume his, and continued to get away with his escape. When the parents arrived home about 20 minutes later, they found the car missing and the front door open. And more importantly, they discovered this horrified 15-year-old tied to her bed, and, and she reported that Nicola was missing. Nicola said on the night that uh, the abduction happened, she was driven all around the neighborhood, and then taken for a short walk, where she got into another vehicle. So Mr. Cruel was just starting to introduce a whole bunch of staging in order to get away with these crimes, showing a lot of uh, a lot of planning and preparation, in my opinion. Now, he kept Nicola for a full day, dumping her without making any contact or further ransom demands with the family. And he left her by an electricity substation, this becomes kind of important, and this is why you want to watch the 60 Minutes Under Investigation. Now, Nicola reported that she was blindfolded for the entire 50-hour ordeal, and that during that time, she even had tape placed across her eyes. And as they were fleeing the scene, she was forced to lay down on the seat with her head down on Mr. Cruel's lap. The family left Australia within six days after Nicola was released, which I'm sure created a real challenge for law enforcement in continuing to follow up on that case. Hey everybody, it's Mike from Profiling Evil. I've been studying criminal behavior for more than 40 years, and one of my favorite research tools is Truthfinder. It's online, and you're not going to believe the information stored there. So if you want to know more about that new neighbor, your babysitter, or your next online date, give Truthfinder a try. I'm including a link below with special discount pricing. You got to click the link to get it and then enter Evil 10 at checkout. We're an affiliate, which means we get a small commission, enough to buy a small diet Dr. Pepper, but you can cancel at any time. Thanks for listening today. And the last victim I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you her full name because sadly she was murdered after the abduction. Her name was Carmen Chan. She was a 13 year old and it happened on the 13th of April in 1991 from Templestow, uh, Melbourne. I hope I said that right. Now, uh, again, both Carmen and Nicola were children that students at the Presbyterian Ladies College there 
in Melbourne. That's the only tie that we've been able to see. In this particular case, Mr. Cruel broke into the house again wearing a mask. And, uh, and this time, it happened earlier in the evening, 8.40 p.m. Carmen was babysitting her sisters, Carly and Karen. And the parents, John and Phyllis, they were working at the family's Chinese restaurant. They were watching TV in the room when Mr. Cruel broke in. And uh, the younger girls had headed to the kitchen to get something to eat. And they bumped into Mr. Cruel, who was wielding a knife. He grabbed him forced him back into the bedroom. Now the youngest, Karen, heard the commotion and was hiding, but when Mr. Cruel found her. Now, again, he quickly spotted her and he made them all get inside some cupboards and he said, listen, I'm not gonna hurt you, I just want your money. But then, holding Carmen by her hair, he said he would come back and get the younger children if they ever said anything. And of course, imagine how terrifying that was for them. Now, Mr. Cruel pushed a bed against the cupboard to keep them trapped inside. They called out to their sister who was drug away into the night. Now, police employed uh, sniffer dogs. That's what they call tracking dogs here in uh, Australia. And uh, the dogs followed the trail to a nearby church road. But that's where they believe Mr. Cruel had his car parked and he disappeared. It only took Carly and Karen about 10 minutes to get out of the area where they were pushed into and locked in that cupboard. They immediately phoned their father at the restaurant and police were alerted and and, uh, the case was, uh, the investigation began. Now again, how did he know this much about them? It goes to show us the amount of planning and preparation that some of these serial predators put into their cases. In many cases, predators like this are looking for opportunistic victims. But these children, they were targeted, and uh, there was a nexus. Whether it was something he was reading in the newspaper, he perhaps saw them at the restaurant that they went to, who knows. But it would take a year later until Carmen Chan was discovered. And what they discovered were her uh, decomposed remains in in the area of a landfill near Edgar's Creek. Now, Carmen, this is a really bizarre thing here, folks. Carmen had been shot three times in the head, which leaves me to believe that she probably saw who the suspect was. And at that point, he had to eliminate her. Again, every other victim up until that point uh, was uh, unable to identify what he looked like and they survived. That's really interesting in this one. Well, after Carmen's death, a task force was set up, and the investigation ran for nearly three years. Cost nearly $4 million in 1990 money. 40 investigators and analysts. There were 27,000 suspects and more than 10,000 tips in this case over the years. You know, I'm saying this because I'm watching what's happening and how the case is unfolding in Idaho. Is there similarities in the the amount of effort being put forward? Um, This is really interesting to think how difficult these cold cases are, especially if it's someone who's not associated with the family, but has focused and targeted them, much like the police in Idaho are saying. Well, there's the case of Mr. Cruel. Again, you can get the details. You can get the in-depth look by going to that 60 Minutes documentary I did with uh, Under Investigation. You can also go back and watch my videos on the Mr. Cruel case, especially the one about going into the rabbit hole because this one is an intriguing case. I'm looking forward to getting back to the States and enjoying the Christmas holiday season. And I hope all of you are doing well. Thanks so much for your support of Profiling Evil. And from all our friends down here in Australia, thanks so much for the genuine hospitality. I want to especially shout out my friends at Esri Australia who set up most of the meetings that I've had while I've been here in town. And especially... Raquel Jackson, who made sure I had a Diet Dr. Pepper when I landed in Brisbane. (laughs) Watch my little clip here with Raquel. Okay, folks, Profiling Evil here in Australia with Raquel Jackson at Esri Australia. 
And look what she found me. Where did you find this? Uh, just over there. So. <laughs> and Raquel, tell them a little bit about why this is such a monumental thing here in Australia. Because we don't, we just don't have this. We, we don't have, Doctor, what is it? Pa Papa? Pe Dr. Pepper. Pepper. No, I, say it. No, Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Dr. Pepper. We know what it is. This is a prescription yeah. in the U.S. And uh, Raquel has been kind enough to find one for me here. Well, thanks, Raquel, and thanks to Mo, who took care of all my travel needs and made sure I was staying in really nice accommodations, like here in Melbourne at the Langham. It is an amazing place with a beautiful view. I'm heading back to the Hilton in, in Sydney, and I'm going to wrap up my trip there. But before I do, I want to share with you what I saw on a little walk outside of Canberra the other day. It was a, a, a early morning walk, about 5.30 in the morning, and I headed off into the trees to see if I could find some kangaroos. It's amazing what we discover when we get off of the beaten path and start to look inside the forest, not just the trees, but inside the forest. And I'll see you soon at the next crime scene.